What is the fourth dimension? Is it beyond length and width and height? Is it time? Is it life? Is it a world of experience beyond the furthest limits of our imagination? What is the fourth dimension? Who am I? Who was I? Who will I be? Am I the present, the past, the future? Or am I a combination of these all together? We have already investigated the mathematical and spatial interpretations of the fourth dimension, constantly running up against the barrier of the sense barrier, now the temporal and the metaphysical interpretations. Time as the fourth dimension, I treat under two headings, the time-space continuum and space-time beings. Here is an example of a very simple space-time continuum. The vertical axis is the number in thousands of high school students in Ontario. The horizontal axis is time in years. A space-time continuum in two dimensions. Einstein required a four-dimensional space-time continuum for the theory of relativity. He explained that a position in our three-dimensional world requires three numbers, the three coordinates with respect to the three corresponding axes. But an event requires as well the instant of time, the fourth dimension. In order to understand this more clearly, let me refer to some of the sections we have done before dealing with the Cartesian geometry in the metaphysical, in the mathematical section. We had the familiar quadratic equations here in two dimensions, here in three dimensions, and you'll notice both times the point P is without subscript because it is a point on a locus, a moving point. And you'll notice also that the distance from the point P to the origin is expressed in the usual manner as we saw before. Here, the fourth dimension, A as space. Also, we discussed symmetry, and I related it to Cartesian geometry, but to be a little more specific, the triangle and the study of its own mirror image. The triangle existing in two-dimensional space has a vertex of P1, X1, Y1, because this is a definite point. The distance from the point P1 to the origin is the usual form, and the other points are familiar to you. To swing the triangle over in the higher dimension, we would add another coordinate of space, as indicated here in Z1. But this is the, tesseract, the tetrahedron, the figure in three dimensions. And you see its vertices as indicated with three coordinates and the distance from the point to the origin. To deal with its mirror image, we use the higher dimensional Cartesian geometry and add to it then a fourth dimension of space and a final fourth dimension in the coordinate A sub 1. And I leave you as homework the work of the Cartesian geometry of proving that this can be rotated in the higher space to become its own mirror image. But you notice that we're dealing here with the fourth dimension as space. You recall that Einstein said the fourth dimension must be time for relativity. And recall once more here that the higher dimension was time, the second dimension. You remember Einstein said the fourth dimension must be time. My nose, for example, a position is located by three numbers in our three-dimensional space. But if I move my head, it becomes an event. And a fourth number, the instant of time, is required. This relationship between this fourth dimension of space and as time brings us to one of the most fabulous things in mathematics, the symbol the square root of negative one. As you recall, in two dimensions, the distance from the point P1, X1, Y1 to the origin is given by this. 
in three dimensions this, in four dimensions this, with A sub 1, the fourth dimension of space. But for Einstein, we have to have the fourth dimension as time and with a negative because, as he explained in relativity, it must be considered that light does not move instantaneously. You will also have to study for homework the meaning of this negative sign. This D stands for the separation of events instead of the distance between points. So if we equate the separation of events in four dimensions with the distance between two points in four dimensions, square both sides and do the simplification, we arrive at this astonishing result that time is equal to the fourth dimension of space times the quantity the square root of negative one. The pure mathematicians call that I. The workaday engineers call it J. Let me continue to read from Einstein. The general theory of relativity gives us still deeper analysis of the time-space continuum. Sir James Jeans. All the phenomena of electromagnetism may be thought of as occurring in a continuum of four dimensions in which it is impossible to separate the space from the time in any absolute manner. I repeat for future. It is impossible to separate the space from the time in any absolute manner. It seems, Jeans continues, appropriate to discard the word ether in favor of the term continuum. The Russian writer Umov, in dealing with moving objects and everything in the universe is in motion, we cannot define the geometrical form, but the kinematical form. And so our measurements must include the three dimensions of height, breadth, and length, represented by the divisions on a tape measure, plus time, the fourth dimension, represented by a movie film. These quotations show that time as the fourth dimension is fundamental to an understanding of modern physics, and I propose to show you that time as the fourth dimension is also fundamental to an understanding of living things. Space-time beings. Let me be a little more personal. I want to ask you a question. Who are you? Who are you? No, I don't mean your name. That's only a label. Who are you? Are you the person sitting there now watching me? Or the person you were a week ago? Or the person you'll be in two years or 10 years? Who were you 20 years ago? Who am I, you ask, to ask you these questions? All right, who am I? Am I the person you're watching now? Of course not, this was taped quite some time ago. Where am I now? Oh, I suppose I'm at Forest Hill Collegiate watching the same person you're looking at. Rather funny show, isn't it? But who am I? Am I this baby? It says Pete Colgrove, aged one year. Or am I this young fellow? Or any other of a succession of photos in my sainted mother's special collection? I propose to you the four-dimensional idea that I am, in fact, the sum of all these cross-sections. Sir Arthur Eddington. An individual is a four-dimensional object of greatly elongated form. In ordinary language, we say that he has considerable extension in time and insignificant extension in space. Practically, he is represented by a line, his track through the world. Uspensky, the Russian philosopher, consider an oak tree. It is the sum of all its stages, from the acorn through to the great tree and on to the fallen giant moldering in the dust. At any moment, a tree is a three-dimensional cross-section of its true four-dimensional self. Uspensky says, a tree is a diagram of the fourth dimension, since its branches are permanent traces of the motion of the growing endpoints, like ice crystals moving on a puddle or on the window pane. Stop talking there, you. That third girl. But whom am I talking to? That creature who was talking a moment ago? Or that little creature there red in the face from 
anger, or shame. She is a sum of these cross-sections of herself. And when I look at my students or my friends, I try to see them not just this segment of the moment, but behind that again a segment and another into the past, extending beyond even to the moment of birth and perhaps beyond that, and extending in this direction behind me where I can't see it into the future. So in order to think of living creatures as the beautiful, symmetrical, four-dimensional hypercube or tesseract, I have to uh, fold them up or anti-project them the way I did with my models, you remember. But no, it's not that. It is not a folding up. It is not an anti-projection. Don't you see it's something different? Let me try to explain it like this. You remember our two-dimensional man in flat land. Now, instead of thinking of him in that house, consider him in the surface of the water. He exists in a two-dimensional universe. He can see in every direction horizontally, but he cannot see up or down. That is outside his universe. What is his experience of my finger? This is a three-dimensional thing passing through his space. He sees a point in a succession of disks. And to get an idea of my finger, he has to add those up in time, the higher dimension to his universe. How would he experience a sphere? Looking along through the surface, suddenly he sees a point, then a circle expanding and expanding until it reaches the maximum of the diameter of the sphere, and then decreasing and decreasing until finally it reaches a point and vanishes. What sort of idea of a sphere could he have by trying to add up this sequence of cross sections? Or what would his experience of a cube be, the three-dimensional unit? If it landed like that, he would see a square and then a series of changing squares. He would have to try to add them up. But if it came in on an angle like this, he would see a point and then a succession of radiating lines, three radiating lines. So when I try to think of you, or when you try to think of yourself, or your father, or your mother, or your teacher as a real creature, you have to see that these people are not just an instant of anger or of stupidity or of affection or of impatience, but they are a succession of these cross sections, which one must try to add up like this poor man in the higher dimension or time. Sir Arthur Eddington has written, an individual is a four dimensional object You are mysterious four-dimensional space-time beings. You think this is getting rather metaphysical. Yes, and with a quotation from J.B. Priestley, we come to the last section. This is from Time and the Conways. Time is only a kind of dream. It merely moves us on in this life from one peephole to the next. At many moment, we're only a cross-section of our real selves. What we really are is the whole stretch of ourselves all our time. And when we come to the end of this life, all those selves, all our times, will be us. And then perhaps we'll find ourselves in another time, as if we're immortal beings and in for a tremendous adventure. Cross-sections added up in time. In the metaphysical section, I suggest that you think of the fourth dimension not just as an extension of mathematics, not just as an extension of space, not even as time, but a fourth dimension of consciousness, which includes all three and transcends them. In order to help you grasp this idea, let me present three demonstrations.
Here is a cylinder of water, and in this is a surface, and that is the universe of our two-dimensional creature. The two-dimensional creature wants to experience this three-dimensional spiral. As the spiral moves, can you see that the experience of the surface is a circling point? So the man in two dimensions experiences the higher thing as a rotation, but there's no motion there. Motion is illusion. It is our experience of something from a higher space. It would be truer, really, to have the higher space object remain stationary and the lower universe, the lower grade of consciousness, move. So that motion is, in fact, the illusory experience of a lower grade of consciousness of something higher. Think of the spinning electrons. Could they be the intersection of our three-dimensional space by stationary four-dimensional spirals? What about the apparently circling planets and satellites in their apparent spiral orbits? What about my finger? Do you think my finger is moving? It appears to move only because you and your universe with time are moving. You see it in the past, the present, and the future. Actually, it is not moving, but it is you who experience it because of your limited perception. This shows how much the state of consciousness must be advanced to experience things as they are. Let me quote from T.S. Eliot. Yet the enchainment of past and future woven in the weakness of the changing body protects mankind from heaven and damnation which flesh cannot endure. Time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. To be conscious is not to be in time, but only in time can the moment in the rose garden, the moment in the arbor where the rain beat, the moment in the drafty church at smoke fall be remembered, involved with past and future. Only through time, time is conquered. Let us pass from literature to painting. Behind this screen is the reproduction of a famous Canadian painting. That is two-dimensional, the screen is two-dimensional, and I have a small slit, which is one-dimensional. By moving this slit in time, I will let you experience this painting. See if you can recognize it. More quickly. Do you see a vertical motion in the slit? But there is no vertical motion. The painting is stationary. Shall I broaden the slit? As you might be able to broaden your consciousness. That is better. Then, you recognize the painting by Lauren Harris, North Shore Lake Superior. But don't you see you're doing the same thing to my lecture? My lecture is a beautiful thing like this beautiful painting, existing in higher dimensions. What are you doing with it? You're scanning it with your narrow slit of the present. Can you expand this slit and get a better impression, not only of my lecture, but of your, of your experiences? Music. Three blind mice. That's in the past. I come to the present. And this one has not yet been sounded in the future. You experience these in your moving time. But now suppose I try to do the same job as I did here. That is, let you experience from a higher level, simultaneously. Cacophony. Why is it that here we have cacophony and here we have the painting in all its beauty. This always makes me think of Mozart and the stories of his possibility of conceiving at once in its entirety a musical composition, say a concerto. Then he must take this beautiful composition and take it out of his mind, note by note, 
in a sequence, a linear sequence, and he puts the score line by line by line. And a conductor and an orchestra have to read it through then, line by line, and try to put it back together again. And a listener in the audience has to pay attention as the music comes sweeping up out of the future, up to the crest of the wave, which is the present, and then down it falls back into the past. And you say, I heard the Mozart concerto. It makes me think of a woman knitting a beautiful sweater. The pattern is magnificent. She finds a flaw. It has to be unraveled. She takes the yarn. She pulls it out. It's a long, linear thing. No design at all. Then she re-knits it back into the beautiful pattern. The spiral, the spiral in three dimensions, the spiral of Mozart wound around on this flat plate. John Balderston in Berkeley Square. Suppose you are in a boat sailing down a winding stream. You watch the banks as they pass you. You went by a grove of maple trees upstream, but you can't see them now, so you saw them in the past. You are watching a field of clover now in the present, but you don't know yet what's around the bend in the stream there ahead of you in the future. I am up in the sky above you in an airplane. I can see it all at once, the maple trees, the clover, what's around the bend. So the past, present, and future to the man in the boat are all one to the man in the airplane. Doesn't that show how all time must really be one? Real time is nothing but an idea in the mind of God. Another spatial analogy. Imagine a magnificent Persian carpet and a carpet a caterpillar crawling across a caterpillar making his one-dimensional way across the two-dimensional rug. One moment he's in a rosy atmosphere, the next it's all dark blue and he sees no rhyme or reason to his life. And then he gets tired, he spins a cocoon. Some time later, he hatches out, he springs into the air, spreads his wings and floats above in the higher dimension and looks down and suddenly perceives with a flash of appreciation and understanding the magnificent pattern of the Persian carpet. Last weekend, you were out celebrating. Today, you're listening to my lecture. Tomorrow, studying for a test. What pattern of life can you see, O oh little caterpillar? This morning, you walked to school. You passed houses. You were thinking about today and tomorrow. The houses in front of you are not being formed for your arrival in the future. And the days are not being formed for your arrival in the future. They are there awaiting your arrival in the same way. Do you ever feel that you've experienced something before? This is one of the strange four-dimensional experiences like apparitions and ghosts, prophetic dreams, clairvoyance, telepathy. This one, déjà vu. I know what's going to happen. I know exactly what he's going to say. Even I know what I'm going to say. Why is that? I like a four-dimensional interpretation. Pick up that little caterpillar on the rug, just a hair's breadth above his universe into higher space. He can see ahead for an instant. Then put him down again, and after this strange mystical experience, he goes along his regular way. Later, he arrives in that same place he had seen before. It's familiar. Similarly, can we have a similar experience? To be raised by some kind of experience of higher consciousness by our own effort or by chance, to see ahead. And then later, when we arrive on the ordinary way, we say, I have been here before. The last part is to help you understand infinity and eternity. I want to show you that four-dimensional ideas can help you understand such problems. To consider the analogy of the sphere. A sphere is three-dimensional with a two-dimensional surface, which is finite, four pi r squared for its area, and yet is unbounded. You go forever, don't come to the end, though you retrace your steps, and it is curved. Einstein says to understand his concept of space, step it up a dimension. You have now a hypersphere. Its surface, so-called, would be 
three-dimensional, our universe. By analogy, it will be unbounded, finite, and curved. If space be curved, there's no beginning and no ending. And so, light would travel in curved lines, and if I stand here, I can see the back of my head, because if I wait long enough, a ray of light starting from the back of my head sails out into space, that direction, circles through space, comes in again in this direction into my eye, and I see the back of my own head. Time and eternity also can be understood specially. As I explained, the physicist says, says that time and space cannot be distinguished absolutely. So if space is curved, time is curved. Well, if time has no beginning and no ending, then what is eternity? Ah, that's the fifth dimension. We haven't time for that today. But it reminds you of the limerick. There was a young lady called Bright, whose speed was faster than light. She set off one day in a relative way and came back the previous night. Curved space. Think of reincarnation with the cycle of birth and death. Think of the snake in Egyptian symbolism swallowing its own tail. From the Bible, Ecclesiastes. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Once again, T.S. Eliot from the Four Quartets. Words move, music moves only in time, but that which is only living can only die. Words after speech reach into the silence. Only by the form, the pattern can words or music reach the stillness as a Chinese jar still moves perpetually in its stillness. Not the stillness of the violin while the note lasts, not that only, but the coexistence. Or say that the end precedes the beginning and the end and the beginning were always there before the beginning and after the end and all is always now. You remember Salvador Dali's bent watches. For me, that's a magnificent symbol of the idea that time is curved, no beginning and no ending, only being. At the recent annual meeting in New York of the annual meeting of the American Physical Society, Putnam, professor of philosophy at Harvard, the guest speaker said, if one takes relativity seriously, what appears in the future to one observer is in the past for another. The future seems unreal because we cannot remember it. We cannot predict the future, but it is there as real today as it will be after the fact. And Wheeler said, when the current expansion of the universe ultimately reverses itself, will time reverse itself? And the Lord said, I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end.